Even Simon himself believed. After being baptized, he stayed constantly with Philip and was amazed when he saw the signs and great miracles that took place. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had, had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Peter and John went down and prayed for the people they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet the Holy Spirit had not come upon any of them. They'd only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on the people. And they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon, the magician from Samaria, saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, Simon offered Peter and John money, saying, Give me also this power. So that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to Simon, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. Phew. Serious. Now that's a preacher. <laughs> Simon the magician said, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may happen to me. Now after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, proclaiming the good news to many villages of the Samaritans. The word of God. For the people of God. If you think that story is weird, you try writing a sermon while you're high on cold meds. <laughs> Breathing treatments for your asthma that got aggravated by the cold. And steroids necessary to calm your body down. Which only hypes your body up. It's the weirdest dang thing I've ever seen in my life. I know you've experienced this, right? You take the steroids to reduce all the inflammation. And it does, and it's awesome. But you're like... <laughs> You know, like all day and all night. So I have no idea how this sermon's going to turn out. Uh, I'm just glad that Bill McDonald preached that it just keeps getting weirder from here last week because that way I got a um, full license. So seriously, I have so many strands of thoughts going through my head as I'm trying to prepare this. So many things happen since I've been gone. Um, you know, one of the weird things is that this school where my son goes up in New, in New York, the colors are orange and purple. I now have a purple hat with an orange H on it for Hobart. Yeah. Okay. That's weird. National school walkout on April 20th, which also, by the way, happens to be weed day. Yeah. And... Somewhere I read was also Hitler's birthday at one point and used to be a national holiday in Germany when everybody thought he was great before they found he wasn't. And somebody said, you know, that Hitler's birthday is now National Weed Day and a school walkout. That's progress. <laughs> but the school walkout, I didn't even know it was happening because I'd been so sick. I mean, just, you know, under a rock for a week with cold meds and feeling terrible. So when I... When I saw that it was happening, I wanted to know a little bit more about it. Because we just had one in March, right? Which was the anniversary of the Valentine's Day massacre at Parkland High School. And I thought, how is this different? So I read about a young woman named Lane Murdoch. I say woman. She's 16. She's barely 16. She just turned 16. A young, young um, teenager up in Connecticut. Lane Murdoch. She said it wasn't so much the February 14th massacre at Stoneman Douglas High School, but the absence in her community of any profound response to it that gave root to her mission. She said, you know, news alerts flashed across everybody's phones, we saw this on TV, and then everything went back to normal. Even I didn't have a huge reaction, she recalled. Because of that, I needed to change myself, and we need to change this country. We should be horrified. And we're not anymore, she says. This kid's 16. She was um, an elementary school child when Newtown happened. When the, when the, the kids, uh, the, the uh, kindergartners and first graders were, were killed. Lane says that 
when she was at school that afternoon, the, the day that Parkland happened, uh, February 14th, at the end of the day, the principal comes over the intercom and talks about school safety and then asks for a moment of silence for the students in Florida. And Lynn said, then our principal said, at the end of the day, it's up to you guys. And Lynn said, I took that to mean us students rather than adults. I took that to mean that we students held responsibility for curbing the school shooting epidemic. It kind of annoyed me, she said. It was, it was up to us to change. It was up to them to change this, and they haven't. And now she's saying it's up to us. She said, you know, that really infuriated me. And she thought, okay, if it's up to us, then, then just watch us. And that night, she, I mean, this kid is, I, I had to start following her. She listens to Benny Goodman. She's 16. <laughs> okay, some of you don't even know who Benny Goodman is. I and mean, he's like popular in what, the 40s? Yep. Okay. Um, she likes platform shoes. And she likes vinyl records. But she's 16. And uh, she sat there that night, uh, February 14th, when this happened at Parkland, and her principal says it's up to you. She said, that night, I came up with a plan for students to walk out of school and protest on Friday, April 20th, which would be the anniversary of the 1999 Columbine High School massacre. Lane was born in 2002, three years after Columbine. Lane and her generation have grown up with school shootings being just part of the context. So finally, she says, the reason I did this is we're 16 and we can't vote. If you can't vote, you don't have a lot of concrete power. As a student, what do you have? What you have is your attendance in school. And there's power to that because there's money to that. Hey, she thought, if we can disrupt the national schedule of kids going to school, and draw attention to the issue, then that is at least a step closer to change. And then she uh, is very clear to say she realizes this is not the end of it. It's only the beginning. Wow, that sounded a lot like Bill McDonald's sermon I listened to, that you think it's over, and it's not. It's just the beginning. There's a lot more left to do. So that's one strand of my thought. Another one is, as Nan said, it's Earth Day. And Yesterday was the first day that I really felt like I was human enough to step foot into the world. And since it was such a beautiful spring day, David and I went to the Arboretum for a walk. And I took some pictures that Melissa's going to put up on the screen for us. That's the tulips in bloom in the Arboretum. And the trees, the cherry trees, and the pear trees. And then that is uh, actually our maple uh, out uh, our Japanese maple out in front of our house. I took that when I got home. When we left for New York last week, that didn't have a leaf on it. Oh, now, it probably was in bloom when I came home, but I had no brain, so I didn't see it till yesterday. <laughs> in conjunction with Earth Day, yesterday was also John Muir's birthday. John Muir is a great conservationist. Uh, he's known as the father of national parks because he's largely responsible for influence influencing the senator who introduced the bill that would, um, that would protect our national parks. And uh, with that, there were a lot of quotes around yesterday on social media by John Muir. Here's just a couple of my favorites. <clears throat> Everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to pray, Places to play in and pray in where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul. Another John Muir quote. I only went out for a walk and finally concluded to stay out until sundown. For going out, I found, was really going in. And now my new personal favorite. I can't believe I've never seen this before. 
Okay, y'all ready for this? Everybody, if you're asleep, wake up. This is the most important thing to hear in the sermon today. You'll hear it again at the end. John Muir quote of all time for our church. Between every two pine trees, there is a door leading to a new way of life. Amen? Okay, we got to say that together. All right, so I'm going to say a phrase and you repeat. Between every two pine trees, there is a door. Leading, leading to a new way of life. Between every two pine trees, there is a door. Leading to a new way of life. See if you can say the whole thing. Between every two pine trees, there is a door leading to a new way of life. One more time. Between every two pine trees, there is a door leading to a new way of life. So that was another strand of my thought. Then Barbara Bush. Now, I have to admit, I don't know a lot about Barbara Bush. She's not somebody I've studied a lot. She was the first lady when I was in college. I always thought of her as kind of elegant and outspoken, but elegant. And that's about all I knew about her. I've read a little bit over the last few days as people have celebrated her life. One of the things I love is that she is known to her family as the enforcer. And she is known as to the Secret Service as tranquility. <laughs> and I think from what I've read, this is a, these two words are great summary of this lady. She is the enforcer and she is tranquility. Strength, yet grace. And dignity, yet sharp wit, and sometimes a sharp tongue. I wore my pearls today in <laughs> honor of Barb. Look, I know she's not perfect. I'm sure there are people who have some things that aren't nice to say about her. But that's true of all of us. And when somebody lives a life like hers, it's important to take the jewels and to celebrate those and bury the curses. Which reminds me, too, of one other strand of thought that I've been meaning to share with you for some time and just haven't found the appropriate time to do it. And that is that um, another great woman of Barbara Bush's generation is my Aunt Marilyn. My Aunt Marilyn was also um, in her 90s, and she died last month. And I think it was right in the midst of everything that was going on around Easter, and so it just sort of got lost in my shuffle. But my Aunt Marilyn is definitely one of my favorite aunts, maybe my favorite aunt. And I had a bunch of them. I had like 10 or 12 because my dad had like eight or nine brothers and sisters. And, you know, like half of them were girls, and then the boys married girls, and so there were a lot of aunts in my life and uncles. I wrote this about my Aunt Marilyn when she died, and I wanted to share it with you. When I was a little girl, we didn't have enough money to take vacations to fancy places. But that didn't matter much to me because we often went to Dallas to see my Aunt Marilyn and Uncle Bud, who had a backyard swimming pool. And I would get to swim all day. All day. And sometimes, even at night, which was so cool. Plus, they always took me out for Mexican food, and they loved to laugh and tell stories. In fact, one of my most precious memories is just hearing both of them cackle with delight over the simplest things. For example, my Uncle Bud would always talk to me using his famous nonsense words, and I know some of you had to go through this earlier when he died a few years back, but just suck it up. You gotta hear it again. <laughs> Uncle Bud would always use words like tacalada for taco, skiskits, for biscuits, and an effluent for elephant. And the thing is, he would be so serious. And when I would say, no, Uncle Bud, that is elephant, he'd say, oh, no, you are wrong, Benny Lou. It is effluent. And he would be so serious. And I would just get so mad. I know y'all have, have a hard time imagining this. I would just argue with him and argue with him, and I'd be so mad, and finally I'd hear my Aunt Marilyn holler out, Wendell, which was his real name. Quit teasing that girl. He would laugh like crazy, and then she would just say, Oh, y'all are just brats, brats, brats. That's what you are. <laughs> and then she would pull me up close to her, and she would hug me, and I could hear her voice. Benny Lou, don't let him tease you like that. 
I love them so much because they love me. They were my favorite because they made me think I was their favorite. And I think I was. My Uncle Bud was working overseas when I was born. And so my Aunt Marilyn and their boys, Don and Gary, who were my brother's age, lived with our family when I was born. And Aunt Marilyn helped take care of me when I, was, when I was a baby. So I think that that's part of the reason, unlike all of my other cousins, I had, you know, they, had, they were around when I was born and they were there living in our home. And that was different. And they, they had all boys. They never had a little girl. And so I was like the little girl they never had. And this is the reason I am a mess. I, I'm spoiled. <laughs> the only little girl in my own family, plus the only little girl in my aunt and uncle's family. Totally spoiled with love. Love that comes from the Braddock clan that my dad and Uncle Wendell, Uncle Bud, were part of. My Aunt Marilyn married into this. She's not a Braddock, she's a Thompson. But she would never know it. I, I never could understand that she actually wasn't flesh and blood of our, of our family. Because she fit right in as if she had grown up with Uncle Bud and his, uh, all his brothers and sisters. And as I've told you before, they didn't have much. They were, uh, you know, a little dirt farm on the outskirts of Houston, which is now inside of Houston. They didn't have much, but they had each other, and that was more than enough. They worked hard. There was always time to enjoy life and have a good laugh. In some ways, my Aunt Marilyn's laugh was the best of all. She just loved to hear Braddock's stories, and she would howl over them as if she'd been there when it happened. That's why I loved her so much, because she loved my family as if it was her own. She loved me, I dare say, as much as her own children and her own brothers and sisters. And she loved Uncle Bud, and she put up with him, which is a miracle, because when my Uncle Bud was like 80 years old, he fell out of a tree and landed on her and broke her ankle. <laughs> and she still loved him. She put up with a lot. I loved how they loved each other. And I wanted so much to be like them. And I hope I am. Some days I think I am. I do know this. I know that I am who I am in part because of Aunt Marilyn and Uncle Bud. So I thank God often, way more often than I ever thought I would. In fact, I never thought I would. I thank God often that we didn't have enough money to go on fancy vacations. Because I might not have spent as much time with Aunt Marilyn and Uncle Bud if we had. Aunt Marilyn, thank you for helping to raise me. Thank you for the love and the laughter, the joy, and all the great memories. All right, so I know that's weird. That's a lot of weird, disconnected things, right? Except one thing. I think all those weird strains have one thing in common. And that's values. Which values are important in life and which are not? The value of an education, the value of being able to um, go to school without fear, the, the value of what power we have in life and what we don't. I never thought I would earn, own a purple piece of merchandise with orange on it. But my son is going to that school, and that is now the most valuable item of clothing I own. My Aunt Marilyn brought values to my life that are priceless. Barbara Bush is revered by so many because of the values that she lived. John Muir literally changed the course of what our country is in terms of our, our, our national parks, we might not have those if not for him, for the values that he instilled in, our, in so many people to, to regard the land as valuable and to protect it. Values. And that brings us back to Simon Magus and Peter and John and Philip 
Because that's what's at stake in this story is values. You ever heard of simony? You never heard of simony? Look it up on your phone if you have one. If you don't have one, look it up in the dictionary when you get to the library. Simony refers to the practice of using <coughs> um, spiritual things to make money. You know, this whole racket of using the church to make money, like uh, the televangelist and all that kind of thing, it's been going on a long time. It goes all the way back to the New Testament and probably back before that. As a matter of fact, the, the story of Simon has some roots in the Old Testament stories in 2 Kings. People are always trying to use God to make a buck. You ever seen that guy on TV that wants to sell you the green handkerchief put on your wallet that will cure your life? Right? It only costs you ten ninety nine, but it will be a donation to God. And, right? Yeah. It's been going on a long time. Simon, Magus, uh, that comes from the Latin translation of the Greek there, which is megos, which means great, right? Mega, right? Megaphone is a loud sound, a great sound. Uh, it also comes from uh, magia, or is related to magia, which means magic. Magic is a great thing. It causes great things to happen. Um, <coughs> magos, by the way, is also used in the Bible to describe the magi, right? The wise men who came from the east at Jesus' birth because they were wise men and astrologers. You're thinking about great powers, and that's what is at stake here in this story is the great powers. I don't know if you notice that, but if you go back and read again in Acts 8, Simon called himself great. I mean, come on. A certain man named Simon had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people, saying that he was someone great. Like, he goes around going, I am great. I am great. I mean, if you have to tell people you're great, that should be a sign right there that that is a problem. People followed Simon Vegas because of all the great things that he did. But then, Philip came and preached the gospel and did great things. And they quit following Simon, and they started following Philip. And so we hear that Simon becomes a believer and gets baptized. The question is why? Does he really believe? Or does he just like see that Philip's really great and he's like, uh-oh, my greatness is now in jeopardy. And so I want to be great, so I'm going to start following Philip. And then when Peter and John show up with the Holy Spirit and start putting their hands on people and baptizing them in the name of the Holy Spirit, he realizes that the stakes are getting higher. So he puts out his offer, give me this power. And he says, so that I may give people the Holy Spirit too. He acts like this is <coughs> all out of a, a desire to bring value to people's lives. Which I think he's only about trying to value his, the lining of his pocket, right? To see if he can uh, make some money off of this deal. <coughs> I love how Eugene Peterson describes uh, Peter's response to Simon and the message, which is a you know modern paraphrase of the Bible. Listen to this. When Simon saw the apostles by merely laying on their hands conferred the spirit, um, Simon pulled his money out excited and said, sell me your secret. Show me how you did that. How much do you want? Name your price. <clears throat> Peter said, to hell with you and your money. <laughs> Why, that's unthinkable trying to buy God's gift. You'll never be part of what God is doing by striking bargains and offering bribes. Change your ways, and now. Ask the master to forgive you for trying to use God to make money. I can see this as an old habit with you. You reek with money lust. Oh, said Simon, pray for me. <laughs> pray to the master that nothing like that will ever happen to me. And that's the end of the story. We we'll never really hear what happens after that. Although there's lots of legendary stuff about Simon and the apocryphal books. You can read about them. Uh, <clears throat> one is about how he levitated himself before Peter and Paul to try to show that he had greater power than they did. Um, but I think the question I want to ask is, what is the difference? What is the value difference between the magic of Simon and the magic of the gospel? And the Holy Spirit that changed people's lives. What's the difference? And here's why, and here, as, as we seek to answer this question, I, I want to share with you one little snippet from the, the weird church book I was telling you about. This is how the book starts. 
<coughs> this is in the very introduction, the very beginning. <coughs> there is a Catholic church just outside the tourist gates of the Forum in Rome called Santa Frances uh, Francesca Romana. It is built on the ruins of the Temple of Venus in Rome. According to legend, this is where you got to pay attention, wake up if you're asleep. According to legend, this church, Santa Francesca Romana, sits on the place where Simon Magus wanted to prove his power is stronger than those of the apostles, and he started levitating in front of Peter and Paul. The two apostles fell on their knees preaching, and Simon fell dying. And what I've heard and what I'm going to find out when I go to Rome on my sabbatical this fall is that there are indentions of Peter and Paul's knees in the rock there <laughs> from where they were praying. This church is just steps away from the Arch of Constantine that marks one of the greatest turning points in history. The military coup that eventually made Christianity the mainstream religion of the empire about 1700 years ago. On a summer day in 2014 in a sea of tourists, the bells chime for 11 a.m. Sunday Mass. Curiously, one of the authors of this book walks in to find that the priest is the only person in the sanctuary. The ancient space, all inspiring, and no one is there for Mass. At the epicenter of the birth of Western civilization and Christendom, no one is attending Mass at Santa Francesca Romana, built on the site where the magic of Christianity overpowered the magic of the Simon Magus of the world. And please hear me, when I use the word magic there, I'm not talking about magic like Harry Potter magic. I'm talking about magic like great. Like what is really great in life? And what is really of value in life? And what is really making a difference in people's lives enough that they would change who they're following? This is how this book starts. Because it's a, it's a warning, it's a wake-up call. We look around now. The question I want to ask is, is, that, is the reason that church is empty because it is no longer the church of Peter and Paul and it has now become the church of Simon Magus? Did we trade our values as Christians when we bought into empire? They go on to say in the book that um, the radical countercultural Jesus movement moved into buildings and became the new normal in most of Europe and now in America. A normal that is increasingly unaligned with the original Jesus movement. Here in America, almost every church considers itself friendly. Right? We do. Yeah. Yeah. Doors wide open. Yeah. Own a. Open and affirming to all. Come on in. Hoping people will show up for services and programs the way they used to show up. But as churches age and cultures shift, fewer and fewer churches are able to get the building traffic. Fewer still are able to translate good building traffic into growing worship attendance and donations sufficient to pay for all the staff and facilities. The focus shifts to consumer mentality that tries to keep church attenders happy, and we end up playing church more than being church. And yet, we are born out of a movement that said no to consumerism. To hell with you and your money, son. The Christian story and movement is birthed out of values and practices that subverted empire, that subverted consumerism, that subverted the practices of people like Simon Magus. <coughs> the good news is that weird church has weird values. Weird church has weird values. And so some people are saying, both among lay people and clergy, that maybe the end of Christendom as we know it, as exemplified by the story of the empty cathedral in Rome, maybe the end of Christendom as we have known it is maybe one of the greatest gifts of the Jesus movement for our time. Because maybe this is going to ask us or force us to ask some really important questions about what we value as church 
and why we would want to give our time and our money to keep this building, this facility going, to keep our community going. What is it about <coughs> Twin Pines that makes us valuable? Is it about what we are consuming? Or is it like what Bill talked about in his sermon about we're, what we're going out to do and to serve? I want you to look again at this John Muir quote that I shared earlier. That, by the way, is a picture I took in Maine on top of Trout Brook Mountain in 2011 when David and I went to visit his family. It was the first time I'd ever been to Maine. Between every two pine trees, there is a door leading to a new way of life. Do we believe this? Not just as people who celebrate the earth, but do we as a church believe this? That right here between these two pine trees at Twin Pines Christian Church, 1139 Dan Park Road, that we really have here the magic of the gospel that will lead people into a new way of life. So as I said on Easter, there is nothing weirder than looking for an Easter Christ in a Good Friday world. There is nothing weirder than believing that people would want to come to churches today in a time when nobody's going to institutional churches anymore. And I guarantee you that if our purpose is just to fill this place up and have enough budget to pay my salary and keep our staff and, and, and pay our property bills, then we need to shut the doors down and forget it. Because we'll be just like uh, Santa Romana to Francesca or whatever it is that's empty. Now we've got to decide what it is between these two pine trees that we have that is the door leading to a new way of life. And that's what I want to hear for you, from you. And so I know this has taken a little longer than normal. I apologize. All I can say is it's cold medicine. I'm blaming on the cold medicine. I'll really try to be well next week and preach like this long. <laughs> Amen. Um, but I want to know, what do you think about Twin Pines is weird good? Weird good. That's the magic. That will bring something of value to people's lives. Like the stories I told you about in the beginning, all these things, all these random stories, but each one of them about some value. I've asked you two weeks ago to, to answer the question about if you and ten friends had to start with nothing, what would you do? I haven't had a chance since I've been sick all week to find out from Lizzie if any of you did your homework, but I will find out. So if you didn't do it, look in the newsletter. The assignment is there. Finish it and now take this assignment. What are the weird values of this congregation? that are magical enough to lead people into a new way of life. I want to know what those values are for you. I want you to tell me. Because everything's at stake. Everything's at stake. We need to pay attention to what's really valuable, what really matters in life. There's no time like the present. There's never been a time that I've felt more compelled for my faith to really make a difference in our world. I know it sounds trite to say it, but honestly, some days I wake up and think, will we be here tomorrow? Will we be here tomorrow? What are we going to do here that's going to ensure that we will be? With that, I invite you into a time of prayer. Because that's what church people have always done when they didn't know what to do. It's what church people have always done when things seem to be at the worst Remember, all this happened today in the story with Simon Vegas after people were being persecuted and run out of Jerusalem by a killer. But they stayed together and they prayed and these amazing things happened. So I'm asking you to pray. Not only for the amazing things that might happen here at Twin Pines for you and for me and for others who are going to come through our doors. But pray for yourself. And pray for God to show you that new way of life that's right here between these two pine trees, or whatever's going on in your life that feels persecuting or, or hopeless. Light a candle if you wish, put a prayer in the prayer box, just stay in your seat and enjoy the prayer music, sing it, hum it, drink it in, drink in the magical spirit of the gospel of Jesus Christ that promises new life, even when everything seems lost. Let us pray.